Thanks, Linda. I'm happy to be the surprise. <laughs> um, so let me just uh, tell a little bit about what, you know, what I saw there. This was my third trip to uh, North Korea, and it was really somewhat different in, uh, in the sense that you did get the sense that hardliners are now paramount in Pyongyang. Um, the, uh, when you get to Pyongyang, there are now billboards all over uh, showing missiles destroying the U.S. Capitol building, showing uh, the U.S. flag uh, being, you know, burning, this kind of thing. Um, I was also struck that in the past I've been able to stay at uh, hotels in the center of Pyongyang to walk around in the evening to interact with people. And this time, the foreign ministry, which hosted me, kept me uh, off, uh, constantly escorted me, did not let me wander off, and kept me in a foreign ministry compound outside the city among the rice paddies. And at first I thought this is because they recognized my, they were trying to protect North Koreans from my incredible reportorial skills. But um, no, <laughs> that it turns out that they were essentially trying to protect me from the security forces who weren't necessarily on board with having an American reporter present. And that was disconcerting. Um, it was also striking that so many North Koreans, um, and of course one never really knows you know, <laughs> whether people are saying what they think, but uh, how many people were saying that they expect a war uh, with the US and that uh, they will not only survive this war, but, uh, but win, but, but, uh, but defeat the US. Um, and I'm, um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm struck that how many security experts think that the risk of a war between the US and North Korea is much greater than I think the public or the financial markets appreciate. And it's partly because we essentially just have a few options that seem likely ahead of us. One is some kind of a deal, uh, probably a freeze for a freeze, a freeze of uh, North Korean nuclear testing and, and missile tests in exchange for some diminution of US military exercises, maybe some reduction in sanctions. I must say, I mean, that's what Rex Tillerson is trying to get, uh, but there doesn't seem to be any support in the White House for that, nor does there seem to be support in Pyongyang for that. Essentially, North Korea wants to go all out for the capacity to strike the US, the, ma the continental US, uh, with nuclear weapons because they think that is going to ensure their survival. Uh, they repeatedly brought up to me uh, Iraq and Libya and said that the mistake that Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi had made was that they uh, did not have nuclear weapons. And so they are, I think, determined to go ahead. So I think a deal is kind of the, is, is still worth pursuing, but I think it's a very long shot. Then a second option is to settle into long-term deterrence as we uh, had with the Soviet Union. Um, one thinks that probably North Korea, it could be deterred from using nuclear weapons just as they've been deterred for decades from using chemical weapons against Seoul or attacking Seoul. Um, but it's an unsettling prospect and um, um, there's also the risk that at some point when North Korea collapses that some lieutenant colonel running a missile silo somewhere decides if the regime's going to go down, then so is Los Angeles. Um, and then the third option um, is some kind of military conflict. And there have been a lot of unsettling signals from the White House um, and one of them is the Pentagon, I think, is, is very nervous about what the White House is thinking. Um, a lot of unsettling signals that the White House thinks that it's better to have a war now than later, that we absolutely can't let North Korea develop that capacity to deliver nuclear weapons, um, and talk about military options such as striking a missile uh, on the launch pad, um, with some kind of warning that if there's any response, that's the end of the regime. Um, and I think that would be astoundingly dangerous um, because there's an enormous risk of escalation if that happens, of miscalculation. Um, if such a war were to stay conventional, then the Congressional Research Service suggested there'd be uh, up to 300,000 deaths in the first few days. 
uh, if it goes, were to go nuclear, um, one estimate is that on the first day, a million people could be killed. I mean, this is staggering consequences. And um, so um, I'm afraid I don't have, I, I came back from Pyongyang feeling not terribly optimistic. Um, but I'd be happy to take any comments, questions. <laughs> Cheer us up. <laughs> Uh, Howard Gardner, Cambridge, thanks very much for the presentation and also for your columns. Um, I'm interested in whether the U.S. government in any form has um, tried to speak with you apart from what you published and in your role as a reporter, um, how, do, how, how, how do you or would you handle this in terms of anything that might not be something you'd want to publish? So, um I mean, one of the problems is that the White House and I are not on the best of terms. <laughs> and so, I mean, I do have friends working in the government who I've known for a long time who are working on security issues, um, and they, uh, they have, I mean, we have spoken, and um, I've told them that I think that their strategy of trying to get China to put pressure on North Korea is uh, probably doomed. Um, there, um, you know, th there, I think there's real, pro real disputes within the administration, and uh, uh, Tillerson trying to do a deal for a deal, Mattis trying to, I think, trick the White House by offering what he calls military options that are non-kinetic, um, and. And Trump and McMaster, I think, genuinely thinking about gen real, you know, strikes on North Korea itself. Nick, I'm, I'm going to take the prerogative, if I may. I, I, have, I forget whether I've heard or read that the Pentagon is sufficiently concerned that they've added extra layers in between the president's decision to push the button and the button actually being enabled. And is that true? Um, so, uh, I, that I don't know. Um, I mean, there were, as you know, sort of a famous incident in 1974 uh, when Nixon was fading and James Lessinger, then the d Defense Secretary, um, um, uh, did uh, stipulate that any order from Nixon uh, should, be, uh, should be confirmed by uh, himself or I think Henry Kissinger, um, but I have not heard about that happening this time. There is a congressional effort by Democratic senators to say that, uh, to pass legislation saying that any first strike on North Korea, uh, absent some immediate threat, uh, should require a, a new authorization of the use of military force, but it's a Demo it's just has Democratic sponsors. I think it's hard to um, see that happening, but I, I, hope, I hope you're right. <laughs> Uh, Michael Turner, Chicago. Um, I wonder if you know who invited you and why they invited you. It's a very close society. And so, um, uh, I mean, I, so every time I go to North Korea, I'm banned for about a dozen years, <laughs> and then they eventually forget they banned me. And so, in the, so this time, something similar uh, happened. And so I'd been aggressively pursuing an invitation. It was the foreign ministry that invited me, and I think it's because the foreign ministry is desperately trying to find exit ramps. And I think the, the foreign ministry in North Korea and the State Department in this country are both kind of parallel, both looking desperately for exit ramps, probably sympathetic to some kind of a freeze for a freeze. And I think in each case, they've been marginalized. Uh, the foreign ministry so they provided our vehicle. Um, they were trying to get, um, you know, they were they were escorting us, and it seemed that we were being tailed by the security forces who didn't trust the foreign ministry, and that again the foreign ministry was nervous that the security guys might um, be unhelpful <laughs> regarding my presence and that of of my three times colleagues. Um, so I think the you know the foreign ministry is trying to find a way out, but is uh, 
under pressure, they're being criticized as uh, tools of the U.S., as softies who don't understand real power. Hmm. Uh, Frank Stewart, New York. Um, as you indicated, uh, North Korea seems to want its nuclear program mainly for defensive reasons, but uh, of course there's the danger which we've uh, had exemplified in the past of the North Koreans spreading nuclear know-how to other places. Uh, so uh, if we have to live with something like the present uh, situation with regard to the armament of North Korea, do you think there's a practical way of preventing further uh, spread of this information and uh, uh, hardware perhaps? So if we were to settle into some kind of long-term deterrence, um, which I think is a, is a very significant prospect, then indeed there are two risks other than them actually uh, being in a bad mood and taking out Los Angeles sometime. And one is precisely the risk of a transfer of nuclear materials, partly just to make money. Um, and the other, though, is that just being more assertive vis-a-vis -vis South Korea in particular, uh, and knowing that then it's harder for either the South or the U.S. to respond. And we can certainly try to tighten up um, their shipping, this kind of thing. I'm, uh, to, to some degree, we can probably do that, although there are a lot of North Korean fishing boats out there um, smuggling this and that. Uh, there are a lot of Chinese fishing boats smuggling out there, but we could probably make some progress on that. On the other concern, though, about them using a nuclear arsenal to, as a, to back up a more aggressive um, policy, security policy in the area, I, I think we're kind of stuck, uh, stuck with that if, if indeed they continue to develop their nuclear program. Then the doctor, I know the doctor Dwork has the last question. Okay. Cynthia Dwork, Harvard. You indicated that there was a change in public sentiment in Korea, in North Korea, toward the United States between your two visits. So, when did the change actually happen, and and why? To what can you describe it? So, um, I think that it is partly uh, Kim Jong-un's ascension. Uh, I think that uh, he genuinely seems kind of a harder line and more aggressive than Kim Jong-il, his father, or Kim Il-sung. Um, you know, it was striking that Kim Il-sung, uh, after the axe murder of an American, uh, two American uh, in 1976, was it? Um, that Kim Il-sung actually issued a statement of regret. Um, in contrast, the, you know, we're seeing the opposite of that kind of uh, thing these days. I think that Kim Jong-un is also much more determined to get nuclear weapons and he feels they're only you know, maybe a year away from proving that they have a solid re-entry vehicle and can hit the U.S. And, and wants to go all out. I also think that even just this year there has been a further hardening and I think that is partly due to President Trump's rhetoric. Um, it was striking to me that in talking to North Koreans, none of them knew about Otto Warmbier, the University of Virginia student who, uh, who was jailed and, and returned in a coma and soon after died. They didn't know about that because North Korea didn't want them to know about that. Uh, in contrast, every North Korean knew all about President Trump's statement about totally destroying North Korea because that fits completely into the Kim Jong-un narrative about how he is the great nationalist protecting the Korean people from imperialist bullies. And I think that not only does his rhetoric fit into that narrative and bolster it, but also his personalization of issues and talking about Kim Jong-un as rocket man, that that um, has hardened them, that that has made it harder to, to do some kind of a freeze for a freeze. Um, and so I think it's a collection, a combination of these sort of more broader institutional factors and and some of this rhetoric that has um, exacerbated the problem. And, and you also, you know, in, in North Korea itself, they may, they may well do an atmospheric nuclear test, uh, which would be unbelievably irresponsible if they do it in the North Pacific. The winds at some point would take it toward North America. 
Um, I think in that case, we would respond in some form. Uh, they may do a test near Guam. I think um, that you know would be um, a huge challenge as well. And people were telling Cheryl and me that um, that Kim Jong Un um, basically gets drunk and plastered every every evening. And so you wonder <laughs> about the quality of his decision making about responding to something. You know, I, if we do, a, if we do a, a, a strike, I do at least hope we do it in the morning hours when he may be sober. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thanks very much.